Hello, and welcome to our next lecture in aerodynamics. Last time, we dove deeper into the world of incompressible and inviscid flows by introducing elementary flow fields, the building blocks of aerodynamics. Four main building blocks, the uniform flow, the source and sink, the doublet, and the vortex were combined in various ways to make four more complex flows. We covered the flow around a semi-infinite body, a ranking oval, a stationary cylinder, and a rotating cylinder. By making flows with streamlined patterns that looked like these bodies, we could recreate the flow behavior as if the body existed in our flow. Today, we'll explore the rotating cylinder in more depth in order to introduce the kutta joukowsky theorem a powerful law in aerodynamics that relates a flow's circulation to the lift produced by a body. So let's jump in. If you remember, in the last video we ended with the stationary cylinder and the rotating cylinder. Let's recreate their streamline patterns here. For the stationary cylinder, you might notice that the flow is symmetric about the vertical plane, meaning there is no drag produced by the flow and it is symmetric in the horizontal plane, meaning there's no lift. In the rotating cylinder, our streamlined pattern is again symmetric about the vertical plane, so again, there's no drag in the flow. However, across the horizontal plane we have asymmetry. This means there is a non-zero lift produced by the body. So what's the main difference between these two flows that causes the asymmetry? The case of the rotating cylinder is really the case of the stationary cylinder with the addition of the point vortex elemental flow, and that point vortex leads to added circulation, which leads to lift. This is the heart of the kutta joukowsky theorem, an equation that relates the lift per unit span in a flow field to the circulation, along with the flow velocity and density. So, circulation added to a flow indicates lift. Interestingly, this relation was found independently by Kutta, a German mathematician, and Joukowsky, a Russian physicist, at the turn of the 20th century. So they have to share the glory. Our goal for the majority of this video will be to try and calculate the lift force from the velocity field of a rotating cylinder, because that leads us to the kutta joukowsky theorem through an example. From our elemental flows video, we derive the velocity field from the stream function, so let's write them down again in their entirety. Remember, we're in cylindrical coordinates still, so the velocity is in the radial, r, and azimuthal, theta directions. We want to get the lift force from this velocity field, and to do this, we're going to need to get the pressure from the velocity field and then from the surface pressure we need to get to the body force. We will prefer to work with appropriate non-dimensional coefficients, like the lift, drag, and pressure coefficients, instead of dealing with the raw quantities. Step 1 will find pressure from velocity. The pressure coefficient is defined similarly to the lift and drag coefficients, where the change in pressure relative to the free stream quantity is divided by 1 half rho u squared commonly known as the dynamic pressure. We assume we know the dynamic pressure, but how do we get to delta P from the velocity field? Well, if our flow is incompressible and inviscid, which it is, we can assume Bernoulli holds true for our flow, and the Bernoulli equation relates a flow's pressure to the velocity. So, write out the Bernoulli equation between two points on a streamline. Point 1 we will take to be far from the foil, so the free stream quantities denoted by the subscript infinity will be used. And with some rearrangement, we can set the difference in pressure, delta p, equal to a function of the flow density and velocity difference. Let's plug this back into our definition of the pressure coefficient. Do some simplification, and we find we can define the pressure coefficient from velocity alone. Now we have a way to take what we know, the velocity field, 
and say something about the pressure. Note, we're going to be concerned with the flow along the surface because we want the pressure distribution on that surface. For a circle, the flow on a surface is defined to be the theta velocity at the radial location of the circle radius, where r equals big R. On to step two. We want to turn the pressure distribution into a force. This is something we were exposed to a few videos ago when we discussed aerodynamic forces. Recall our equations for finding the normal force and axial force of a body from integrals of the pressure and shear distribution on the upper and lower surfaces of that body. Let's write them down out and in their entirety. For us, flow is inviscid, so all those pesky shear terms go away. These equations are for an arbitrary body, like an airfoil, but we can take some shortcuts because our shape is a cylinder. First, we can turn the surface coordinate s into the x and y components. Notice, for a second we have popped back into the Cartesian coordinate system, but don't get comfortable, it doesn't last that long. And since our body is on an axis, the center line of the cylinder is effectively aligned with the flow velocity, which means the lift and drag are equal to the normal and axial forces respectively. Let's make these simplifications into the above equations and write out what we have so far. We've already non-dimensionalized our pressure into the pressure coefficient, so we need to express our equations in terms of lift and drag coefficients too. In the lift and drag coefficient equations, we typically deal with airfoils that have a chord C, but here we will replace that C value with the cylinder diameter D, which is our important streamwise length scale. Okay, so we've got them in Cartesian form, but that's no good for our round flow, so we'll have to transform back into the cylindrical coordinates. Apply the transformations for x dx, y and dy, to theta d theta, r and dr. And for convenience, we'll write out the diameter as 2 times r, the cylinder radius, since r shows up elsewhere in our equation and we can cancel it out. After the transformation, we're back to being uncomfortable in our cylindrical coordinate system. These integrals deal separately with the top and bottom surfaces, because a lot of aerodynamic bodies are different on the top and bottom. However, for a cylinder, the top and bottom are equal. So we can combine our integrals and in integrate around the entire cylinder surface from 0 to 2 pi. Before we put our pressure coefficient into this equation, let's try to get it in its final form. Take what we derived above and plug our velocity field for a rotating cylinder into the pressure coefficient equation. We can expand our squared parentheses and get it a bit easier to work with for the upcoming integration. And now we're ready to calculate the lift and drag force for our flow, finally. And just in case we forgot what it looks like, let's sketch the flow again here. We notice at the beginning of the lecture that because we have symmetry about the vertical axis, we expect that there is no drag in the flow. Let's check that. Take our drag equation derived above and plug in our coefficient of pressure. There are only four terms to worry about here in the integral, all multiplied by cosine theta. Conveniently, sine and cosine functions are oscillatory about a mean of zero. That means many of their products integrate to zero. First, the integral of cosine theta from zero to two pi is zero, which gets rid of two of our terms. Also, the integral of sine squared times cosine is also zero, getting rid of our second term. And the integral of sine and cosine is zero, because of their anti-correlation, so we can get rid of our third term. 
With no terms left, we can confidently say that the drag of this flow is analytically zero, just like we anticipated. Note this is only for an incompressible and inviscid assumption. Now, let's move to the lift with a similar approach. We said the asymmetry about the horizontal axis means there is non-zero lift. Let's see what this is. Take the lift coefficient equation and plug in our pressure coefficient. Again, we have four terms in our integral. And again, we'll use some convenient properties of the integrals of sine functions so that we can get rid of all but one of our terms. This is because sine squared does not oscillate about zero. Therefore, it has a non-zero integral. Let's do out the integral for that term, realizing that most of it's a constant, and we find that the lift coefficient is equal to the circulation over the cylinder radius and the flow velocity. Let's turn this back into the lift per unit span and simplify where we can. And finally, we arrive at an equation relating the lift per unit span to the flow circulation. And this is known as the kutta joukowsky theorem. Importantly, although we derive this for a rotating cylinder, it actually works for flows over bodies with an arbitrary shape, making it a powerful tool in aerodynamics. Let's say we have flow over an airfoil. Far from the foil, we know flow is inviscid. However, near the surface, in reality, we have this pesky boundary layer region where the viscosity is important. Let's draw a loop around the foil, purposefully enclosing all of the area where we can't assume flow is inviscid, meaning that flow outside of our loop is inviscid entirely, and calculate the circulation of the loop. As long as all of the flow circulation production is accounted for, meaning we have enclosed all of our viscous flow, we can use the kutta joukowsky theorem to get the lift. You might be wondering how this works because our airfoil isn't spinning like the cylinder was. Well, the curvature of the airfoil and its angle cause the flow to rotate around the body, which adds this circulation. However, keep in mind I am usually careful to say that circulation indicates lift. It does not cause it. Lift and drag forces are made by pressure and shear stress distributions, and unless there's an odd body force, that's it. For the most part, surface stress is the only way a fluid can force an object. Circulation is merely the footprint of the lift. In a way, kutta joukowsky is analyzing the size and depth of the footprint to say something about the pedestrian walking. Nevertheless, this is a hugely popular and powerful concept in aerodynamics and is widely used. In practice, you can see kutta joukowsky in both experiments and simulations. Say you're working for Boeing and you designed a new airfoil. But now that you have a new airfoil, you have to get its lift characteristics. So you make yourself a model, you scale it properly, and you stick it in a wind tunnel. You can get the lift a number of ways. You could directly measure it with a force sensor. Otherwise, you could somehow measure the surface pressure distribution and integrate that, though I wouldn't recommend it. Or, you could measure the flow field around the foil and calculate the circulation to get you the lift force from the flow field. Any option works, really, but a lot of the time you already plan to measure the flow field anyway to assess other flow behaviors in your measurements so getting circulation can be easy that way. In simulations, this theorem is at the heart of the vortex panel method. This simulation is where arbitrary bodies are replaced by sheets of small vortices. For the simulation to calculate the lift, it looks at the circulation of the vortices in the sheet, thereby using the kutta joukowsky theorem. And that's it. Let's review. We started today by revisiting the stationary and rotating cylinder from our elemental flows lecture, 
and noting that the only difference between them that could cause a lift force is the addition of the vortex, which is driven by circulation. We took the velocity field of the rotating cylinder with the goal of calculating the lift. First, we turn the velocity into pressure via the Bernoulli equation. Then, we calculated the lift force from that pressure distribution. By calculating the lift and drag directly from the velocity field, we confirmed our suspicion that the lift force was non-zero and turns out to be directly correlated to the flow circulation. This example reveals the cutter joukowsky theorem, which works for any flow where the circulation can be calculated in a way that you can capture all of the circulation-producing mechanisms. And we ended with how you might come across cutter joukowsky as an aerodynamicist. I hope you enjoyed the video, and thanks for watching.